Welcome back. Hopefully uh, you had a lovely break. To the quiz, first of all, um, here we are, look. I asked, yeah, what I really want is a string of numbers from this, but I'm not getting it. Why? And I've had some great answers on Twitter. Uh, and essentially, this is where the problem is. What we're doing when I make this slice of string here, I'm setting the size of it to zero, and I'm using this length variable as, a, as the capacity. So while there's capacity for 10 strings, there's actually none in there. And so when I range over that, it doesn't do anything. It's a no op. So the fix would be to use that as the second argument, to use that as the, as the length. And then when I range over that, I will have an, uh, I will have an index, uh, an item for each of those. So that's that. That's the quiz. Um, and more of, more of those to come. Um, so hello, Andre Ericsson. Nice to meet you. How's it going? Hello, likewise. I'm doing well, thanks. Good. Um, your charity, you chose ACLU, right? Could you tell me why you chose that particular yeah. charity? So for those who don't know, the ACLU has been fighting for civil uh, liberties for over 100 years by now, which is pretty amazing. Mm. Um, they are obviously very relevant right now, fighting for racial justice. But What's more, the reason, the primary reason I chose them is because not only can we trust them to do that today, we can also trust them to keep doing that going forward for whatever the most important civil uh, liberties issues are of our time. So that includes not only uh, racial justice, but also LGBTQ rights, women's rights, free speech, and more. So it seems yeah. like a great, uh, great choice. Bit. Yeah, I think so. Um, Andre, did, did you used to be a Python programmer by any chance? Yes, that's right. Yeah, and you want to, what, move away from Python to Go? Yeah, for those who know me, I've been a long time uh, advocate of, of moving to Go. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to learn more about that now because uh, this is what your talk's telling us about, right? So uh, I'll, without any further ado, please welcome and do clap at home, uh, Andre Erickson. Thanks, Andre. Thank you so much. All right, I'll go ahead and share my screen and we'll get going. Great, so thank you so much everyone for being here. Um, this is a talk about a project of mine called Py2Go, programmatically translating Python to idiomatic Go. And before we begin a little bit about myself, my name is Andre Eriksson and I've been a staff software engineer at Spotify for the past seven years. I also recently founded a startup called Encore, which is a platform for rapid backend development, and it's specifically designed for Go. But we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about a pet project that I was hacking on during my time at Spotify. And it should be said, even though we didn't end up using this in production, I'd like to think that in some uh, alternate universe, we did use it. So with that out of the way, we're going to start with uh, a story. And so this story is about what was a long time coming in September 2019. The Python Software Foundation announced, uh, the PSF, that Python 2 would finally be deprecated by the end of the year. And my memory of exactly what happened with this announcement is a bit hazy, but I seem to recall that our reaction at work went something like this. And I know the sound is not working for this, so you'll have to live without sound. Yeah, that's uh, definitely how everything played out. So with that, we're trying to explore our options and figure out what to do with our tech stack. So uh, it was all written in Python 2. 
And there were a few main factors that were impacting our decision. We knew we wanted static typing. Our code base was pretty large and business critical. And most of the company had at this point already migrated to Java, primarily for scalability reasons. But we hadn't since we didn't have a strict scalability requirements. And we didn't want to rewrite. Uh, it was hard to justify, and it would be a multi-year effort, and the opportunity cost was just too great. So at this point, as, uh, as I talked about, I've been an advocate for adopting Go for several years, and I finally saw my chance. So I thought to myself, could we rewrite everything in Go programmatically? And so there were many good reasons for doing it, right? We were already using green threading in Python, and so Go routines would be a natural fit. Moreover, uh, uh, Go supports uh, type inference and multiple returns, which would make the translation from Python much easier. And generally, when you programmatically rewrite something, the output ends up looking pretty alien and not at all like something you would write yourself. But luckily, Go has GoFunt, and this would drastically reduce the dissonance and make the code much more like what you would write by hand. Of course, there were many things going against it, uh, not least of which is that Python is a dynamically typed language. So here, since we don't know the type of X, we cannot possibly write out a function signature. Uh, we don't know neither the type of the parameter X, nor do we know the return type, since that is the same as X. Exceptions are also tricky to handle. You could say we could rewrite this with panic and recover, but that only works at the function level. Uh, deferred uh, recover only runs in deferred functions, whereas uh, try catch can happen anywhere in the function body. And if you use mocks for testing, in Python, you can kind of do whatever you want. You can monkey patch objects at runtime. You can replace basically anything with mocks. Whereas in Go, you can't really do that as easily. And so my master plan was something like this. Friday afternoon rolls around, and people head out of the office for the weekend, You know, back when people actually went to the office in the first place. And then over the weekend, I would sneak in under the cover of darkness. I would translate the whole code base to Go, and then head back home. And when people come in uh, to the office again on Monday, they would realize that everything is in Go, and we have grown wings, and we can all fly, and the world is a magical place. And Python 2 would just be a distant memory, like a bad dream or something. And so I was thinking a lot, like, how could we actually achieve something like this? And so I realized there was an escape hatch with uh, mostly about how we were using Python. You see, our, since our code base was so large, we were, for maintainability reasons, effectively writing Python as if it were statically typed anyway. So this made it much easier to translate to a statically typed language. For the same reasons, we didn't really use metaprogramming or magic methods in Python. These are things that let you make uh, classes behave, you know, with other language features, and you don't really understand what's going on. We were instead writing Python kind of like how you would write Go in a fairly simple but straightforward manner. And lastly, the way we were writing tests was not with mocks, but we were instead asserting on the visible behaviors, mostly consisting of passing in inputs to some component of the system and then asserting on the output. And such tests would also be possible to convert to Go which would drastically increase the confidence in the translation. So I started experimenting with how we could do something like this. And I quickly settled on an approach like this. We start by parsing the Python source into an abstract syntax tree. Then we perform whole program analysis of the source code to resolve what object each identifier refers to. Then we perform type inference of the whole program so that we can actually understand what type to place at every place where Go actually needs you to specify the type upfront. And last, 
we translate the fully typed Python program into an equivalent uh, idiomatic Go uh, program. So let's uh, look into these steps in more detail, starting with step number one, parsing Python in Go. So for example, here's a simple Python program for the infamous uh, FizzBuzz uh, interview question. And we would like to create a parse tree out of this. And while there are many great parsers for Python written in Python, I couldn't find a great one for my purposes that was written in Go. So I ended up writing one. It's a pretty straightforward recursive descent parser, very similar in style to uh, the Go AST and Go parser packages in the Go standard library. By far the most interesting part was learning exactly how Python's uh, white space nesting uh, uh, structure works, which was pretty fun. And if you run this parser on the FizzBuzz program from two slides ago, you get something like this. The tree structure has been slightly simplified to fit on a slide, but you get the idea. So now that we have a syntax tree, it's time for whole program analysis. And again, what we would like to do here is we want to, for every identifier in the whole program, we would like to identify what object is it referring to. And normally in Python, you can't really do that because there's so much runtime magic uh, that's possible, such as replacing a class with another or uh, redefining a method on an existing class and so on. So to make this tractable, we needed to introduce a few constraints. First of all, we have to disallow replacing or redefining top level objects. So this is not allowed. Secondly, so that we can resolve everything statically, we cannot allow for dynamic imports or conditional imports. Next, in order to make type inference possible, we need to know exactly where every field is being accessed. So we can't allow for dynamic field access like this. So now that we have that, let's take a look at uh, an example to better illustrate what we want to do. Here's a simple Python class. We have, uh, it's called cat. Uh, it takes a name parameter in its constructor and it assigns it to the self.name field. So we know there's a name field on the cat uh, struct. Next, it has a sound method, which uh, returns the string name goes meow. Now let's introduce a second class person. In its constructor, we instantiate a cat object and we assign it to the self.cat field. And we have a pet method which uh, prints the sound the cat makes. As I, as I looked at the slide, I realized that this makes it seem like we're petting the person, but the intent is that we're petting the cat. I, I think you, you get it. So what can we say about the identifiers in this program? Well, first of all, we can say that these must both refer to the same object, namely the name field on the cat. And we can say that this uh, cat object that we're instantiating on line 11 must refer to this cat class. We also know from the fact that we're assigning that object to the self.cat field, we can also say that the type of that field must be an instance of the cat class. We can also say that self.cat here on line 14 refers to the same uh, cat field on line 11. And crucially, since we know that type, we know that self.cat.sound must refer to the sound method in the cat class. So even though we don't have any type information at this point, we, or at least very little, we can say quite a bit about what objects each identifier is referring to. So with that, we can begin to perform type inference. And we start by introducing a gradual type system that's inspired by TypeScript and the way it approaches gradually adding types to JavaScript. And the way it works is when you have an expression where the type is known, such as the string literal bar, if you assign that to a variable foo, we say 
we can immediately say that foo has type string. On the other hand, if instead you define foo to equal the return value of some function bar, and we don't know the return type of that function, we say that foo has type unknown. And then we're going to look at the same code as before, and we're going to explain how we can do type inference of the whole program. But to make it easier, we're going to do it based on Go syntax, where we can actually see the types. So here is uh, the cat class translated into Go. And we can see that in many places, we have an unknown type. This is because uh, the Python program is lacking type information. If we look at the person struct, the situation is a little bit better since we could already infer the type of the cat field. But we're still missing type information here. So how do we solve this? Well, we do it by introducing what I call type propagation. And what I mean by that is when we have some type information, we can actually use that to derive more type information by propagating these types throughout the whole program and across function boundaries. So let's take a look at how that works. Here we have the two structs uh, side by side. And from before, we know that this function call on the right refers to the new cat function on the left. And as we can see, we're calling this with a string literal. So this means that we can infer that the name parameter must be of type string. And since we're then assigning that to the self.name field, we can say that the name field must also be of type string. If we look down on the sound method, we can see that we are returning a string here. And that must mean that the return type of the sound method is also string. If we look on the right in the pet method, we can see that there is actually no return statement at all. So the pet method must have no return values whatsoever. So based on this, uh, this reasoning, uh, we went from a fully uh, uh, a Python program where there is no type information defi explicitly defined at all to a fully typed program. And now that we have a fully typed program, we can go ahead with step four, translation. And so for this section, I thought instead of showing a bunch of examples, uh, screenshots, let's instead do a live demo, which brings us to part three of the talk, the part where we rewrite stuff in Go. So I'm going to share my editor instead. And we're going to take a look at the same example. Uh, we're going to start here, actually. So this is the FizzBuzz program that I showed you before. What we're doing here is we are looping over the integers from 1 to 15. And we're saying, if the number is divisible by 3 and divisible by 5, we print FizzBuzz. If the number is divisible by 3, we print Fizz. If the number is divisible by 5, we print buzz. And otherwise, we print uh, the number itself. So if we run this program in Python, you can see that it is producing the outcome we expect. And now we can run this with our Py2Go tool. And the way this works is we have to specify uh, this is on a whole program analysis. So we have to specify the import path to the program. We're just going to specify examples because this doesn't really matter with such a small example. And we're going to say the output should go in the out folder. And we are going to specify the this bus uh, program. So what happened then is we have now a Go program here. Let's take a look at what that looks like. So here we can see that the function has been replaced with camel case. The range loop has been replaced with a traditional for loop. And since we're doing modular arithmetic here, this uh, stays the same in Python, uh, in Go. 
and the print statements have been replaced by a call to film to print line. So if we run this, you can see that the Go program produces exactly the same results as the Python program. Now let's take a look at the CAD example. I'm not going to go too much into detail since we've already walked through this, but I'm going to show you that the pi to go command does exactly what we walked through together. If we run this, we can see that indeed the output is that Mr. Whiskers goes meow based on this call. Now, if we run the pi to go command, but instead of using fizzbuzz, we use the cat input. You can see, again, the fully converted Go program. And here we can see that uh, this is exactly the same that we walked through together. One notable difference is here we're using the percent operator in Python as a string interpolation. And since we have full type information in uh, when we do the translation to Go, instead of keeping this uh, in Go, we translate it into this printf uh, uh, function. So now this is a fully functioning Go program, so we can run that. We can see that again, Mr. Whiskers goes meow in Go to. And for the final example, I wanted to show something slightly different and. I found this quick sort implementation on the interwebs. And here we pass in an array, which is not sorted. And uh, this is essentially a very naive implementation of quick sort. We find a pivot uh, and then we recurse by calling quick sort again on the part uh, of the array before the pivot and the part of the array after the pivot. So if we run this in Python, we can see that the array is successfully sorted. And again, we can just uh, translate this to Go, which produces a Go program. And here we can see that this Go program is fully typed. And it inferred that the slice is of ints, since we're passing in a slice of ints. And Another thing to point out is that since the partition function starts with a leading underscore, we translate this to an unexported function in Go. So if we run this program, we can see that this too produces a sorted array. So with that, I am going to once more, go back to the presentation. And that's uh, really all I was going to show you for today. Uh, so to conclude, Go is really a perfect target for programmatic translation of source code. The output is perfectly legible Go code, largely thanks to GoFunds and our ability to use type information to replace things with the more idiomatic uh, Go versions. And finally, with the right constraints in place, even dynamically typed languages can be tractable. So thank you so much. Um, if you're interested in checking out Encore, you can check it out at Encore.dev. But uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Brilliant. Uh, thank you so much, Andre. I cannot believe how readable the Go code is to get created from that. Usually, whenever there's any kind of code generation or transliteration or any of that, the, the resulting code generally looks quite ugly, doesn't it? Quite difficult. That looks like it is handwritten Go code. Yeah, well, that's uh, largely thanks to uh, GoFund, but also the fact that uh, you know Go is a fairly simple language, so there aren't that much uh 
room to play around with really fancy ways of doing things. And yeah. Um, and yeah, so a couple of questions have coming up in the feed there. Um, mm -hmm. what, would you recommend, you wouldn't recommend this as a way of developing, would you? Is, is this something you would do as a one-off step and then you would main start to maintain the Go version? Or do you think it actually could be part of a pipeline? Oops. I need to turn on the lights in. It looks like um, a music video. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, I think if you seriously wanted to do this, I would do it as a one-off thing. Um, so we were exploring using uh, Go only because of the maintainability benefits of types. So if we were actually to do this, we would have you know, prepared for it by making adjustments to the Python source to better accommodate. And then we would run this, and we would get something like 90 to 95% correct Go code. And then we would fix it by hand and then just move forward with mm -hmm. the, the Go code. That's kind of the idea. I know lots of people have little Python scripts that just do little jobs for them. And this mm -hmm. is perfect for that situation. And do you also recommend it as a way for people that want that learned that already had learned Python and they want to learn Go? Could this be an interesting way to sort of uh, to to help learn? Do you think? I hadn't thought about that, but it's a pretty interesting idea. I mean, it's very useful to be able to take the same program and compare it in different languages to kind of explore how the new language works. So yeah, I think that could be interesting. Yeah. Well, uh, a lot of people in the feed were kind of blown away. If we didn't trust you, Andre, we would just <laughs> think that was all fake. Yeah. <laughs> but genuinely, uh, yeah, quite surprising to see that it, it does such a good job. Um, so yeah, a little bit blown away. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, if anyone's smart. got any questions, are you going to be hanging out in the networking tab or anything like that? Absolutely. I'll be around the whole time. So you might get lucky and get to spend two minutes, 40 seconds with Andre. And you can tell him what you thought about his wonderful uh, talk there, which is just mind blowing. Um, OK, so we're going to have another break coming up. And I'm just checking the times because it's confusing for me because I'm in a different time zone. Uh, actually, Andre, if you could fix time zones in the same yeah. way, that would be really good, really helpful. <laughs> I never want to hear we'll something like not in my time zone, ideally. Yeah. Um, so we do have another break coming up. We're going to be back at 15 minutes past. Um, I'm going to tweet this out, but here's the next quiz. And I want to know what this code prints. And I'm going to literally tweet that because you'd have to see it to follow it, I think. OK, we'll see you at 15 minutes past. Now we smile like daytime TV.